And so I, I do labour to hear from God to bring a word for our church. And I feel like this word is not just for our church, but actually for the church, globally. Um, we've been through such a season of shaking. It's like God got the whole world and, and shook it to, to see what would remain. And now he's in the process of reassembling things in correct order. And I've been loving our Bible in a year. Confession time. I haven't left Judges. I'm still there. I'm still, I'm still hanging out in Judges. Pastor Jürgen and I, most mornings, will read our Bible together at the same time. It is hysterical because we'll sit across from each other. We're both getting revelation at the same time, interrupting each other with like truth bombs. Oh my gosh, babe, did you read this? Did you see this? Um, it's like iron sharpening iron. And I really, I want to encourage you, if you're married here today and you have the ability, I know some of you have little kids and, or, or start work early or whatever it may be, but if you have the ability to read your Bible together with your husband or your wife, it is so powerful. I, I literally think it's, it's, the, um, it's the fulfillment of the Scripture, iron sharpening iron. And there's a bonding that happens. We're more than physical beings. We're spiritual beings. And, and when we share with each other what God is speaking to us, it's like you're getting an amen from the other part of you because the two become one flesh, right? So, so it's only amplified our, our revelation when we, when we read the Word of God together. All right, I think that's good, isn't it? I wanna read to you from a passage of Scripture from the book of Judges because clearly that's where I'm spending all my time. Judges just blows me away every time I read it because it really reveals to us how broken and dark the world is without Christian leadership. Over and over in the book of Judges, you're gonna hear this phrase spoken. There was no king in those days, no Christian leadership, nobody leading. Therefore, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. America, you are here. In fact, we're kind of on the edge of, of stepping into a new day, I would say. Um, the, the earth is cyclical in a lot of ways. The things that happened are happening again. We, we, we kind of change the century, but the issues remain the same. But the book of Judges is followed by the book of Ruth. And Ruth is like a spin-off series of the book of Judges. They, they happen simultaneously. So it's like Yellowstone in 1883. Like it's the spin-off. Ruth is the spin-off of Judges. It happened at the same time. But then after the book of Judges, we bump into the book of Samuel, the rise of the prophets. And can I just say to you prophetically today that when the world is at its darkest, and we're gonna read this story and we're gonna see a shift because the story I'm about to read is at the very end of the book of Judges. And all of a sudden, the, these Israeli people were awakened to the depravity of their world. And then that led to a woman by the name of Hannah travailing in prayer for a baby. And that baby was the prophet Samuel and he was the anointer of kings. Isn't that amazing? So the darkest time in history when people turn from their wicked ways and cry out to God will lead to the rise of the prophets and the rise of the kings. So I'll just put that out, out there for you. But I'm gonna start reading this passage of scripture just so you know if you have babies in here, what I'm about to read is very brutal. It is probably the most brutal in, story in the entire book of the Bible. I just want you to be aware of that. In fact, it's so brutal that Bible scholars say, you should never read this out loud. Wow. So I'm gonna read it out loud. Um, they, they say you can refer to it, but please don't read it. It's, it's too disturbing. So um, I just want you to be prepared for that if you have kids in the building here today says this in Judges 19, starting at verse 1. And it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite, just to give you some backstory, the Levites were the priestly tribe of Israel. And he was staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. I, I mean, I already have a problem with this because if you're a priest called to be carrying the message of God to the people, what are you doing living in isolations in the mountains? 
And then he took for himself a concubine, interesting. <laughs> Bible doesn't speak of him having a wife. It just says that when it came time for him to, to connect with a woman, as is typical with men, instead of choosing a wife, he chose a concubine. But his concubine played the harlot against him. Interesting. Hmm. I've been in ministry a long time, and maybe let me just use this as an indication to say how you treat somebody is usually how they will behave. He called her a concubine. He didn't call her wife. I'm not shocked that the, she then played the harlot against him. And now I'm not condoning adultery by any means. However, this woman clearly, clearly had responded to the label that had been put on her. And she went away from him, that is the priest, the Levite, so she's unfaithful. And then she runs away from the house of the Levite, the priest, to her father's house in Bethlehem in Judah. Somebody say her father's house. And she was there for four whole months. And then her husband arose finally and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back, having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him and he stayed with him three days. So they ate and they drank and they lodged there. Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, refresh your heart with a morsel of bread and then afterwards go your way. So they sat down and the two of them ate and drank together. And we see over and over again throughout this passage, the father is creating an environment of hospitality and refreshment and welcome and acceptance and asking them to linger, asking them to linger, even to the point so much as the, the, the Levite priest and his wife that he called a concubine were about to leave and the father implored them, it is getting dark out there. Don't leave now. Go tomorrow morning so you can go home in the light. But instead, the priest, the Levite, took his wife slash concubine and they went on the long journey home. On the way home, and we'll pick it up in verse 21, uh, the Bible says that they came into a, a part of Jerusalem, Israel, that was so broken and so depraved that nobody was hospitable in that place. It was very clear that even though Israel were God's people, they were behaving and operating in the customs of the world. There was no difference between them and the Amalekites and the Philistines. They could have been interchangeable by the way they lived. Israel had fallen. However, in this town, he meets a man, an old man, so he still was around long enough. He was from the boomer generation that he still knew a thing or two about how to treat people and what God's laws had, had uh, were, and so... He invites the priest and his wife concubine into the household to keep them safe because he knew it was not safe for them to be out in the public square amongst Israeli people after dark. So he brings him into his house and then something horrifying happens. And that as they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city Remember again, I'm talking about Israel, not Sodom and Gomorrah, Israel. Perverted men surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man saying, bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. But the man, the master of the house went on to them and said to them, no, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, do not commit this outrage. At least this old man understands that this is a perversion and an outrage. But then things take a very, very deadly twist. Look, instead of defiling the Levite priest man, here is my virgin daughter. Here is the most innocent amongst us. 
and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them. Are you hearing this? And do with them as you please. But to this man, do not do such a vile thing. Wow, what, what an inversion here. But the, man would, the men would not heed him. So the man took his concubine, the man, the priest, the man took his concubine and brought her out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. When her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, there was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands clutching the threshold. And he said to her, get up, get up, let us be going. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her up onto the donkey and the man got up and went back to his place in the remote mountains. When he entered his house, he took a knife and laid hold of his concubine and divided her, cut her up into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was, all who saw it said, no such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer it, and speak up. The title of my message is this, when the house of the priest doesn't feel like the house of the father. When the house of the priest doesn't feel like the house of the father. It's interesting to me that after this woman who is not called wife and treated like a concubine, not treasured like a wife should be treasured, she was used and abused and discarded and spoken to poorly, runs away looking for love in all the wrong places. And typically, not always, not always, I know this, but typically when a woman strays and is unfaithful, it's not because she's looking for sex, it's because she's looking for love. She's looking for companionship. She's looking for an emotional need that isn't being met. But she's unfaithful and then instead of running back to the house of the priest to, to, to fall at his knees and ask for penitence, she runs back to the house of her father. I wonder when this woman was joined with someone from the Levite tribe, if she thought to herself, this is, this is all my dreams come true. I'm marrying a man of God. Like this is, this is going to be amazing. I imagine that she had dreams and desires as a little girl to grow old with someone who loved her, to have babies and grandbabies and create a home and create a life and leave a legacy. But instead of being cherished like a bride, she was used like a concubine. And then in this story, we see her fleeing the house of the priest, looking for love in all the wrong places, and then running back to the house of her father. There are a lot of things that I could pull out of this story today, but I wanna make the distinction between the spirit of the Levite and the spirit of the father. And I think in this age and this era, it's very important for us to make that distinction. As the world shakes, under the weight of growing scandals coming out of the church, it is important that we define what the Spirit of God's house looks like. And a house may have a priest, yes, but it doesn't mean it has the Spirit of the Father. So I wanna take a few moments today to make the distinction between these two homes. First of all, let's look at the house of the Father. The first thing we see is welcome and acceptance. When, when the, the Levite, the priest, finally shows up after four months, wow, missing sex, decides he's gonna come to the house of the father, we find that the father is glad to meet him, glad to greet him, glad to bring him back in. Now understand that to play around with adultery in those days, this woman who was called a concubine was, was playing a very, very serious game of Russian roulette in those days, 
if you committed adultery, you would be stoned. You didn't play around like that. This wasn't, you know, the real housewives of the Old Testament that, where they were just dropping it like it was hot with anyone who'd <laughs> looked their way sideways. Like that, that was a dangerous game to play. And yet her heart was so broken, she indulged in something that she knew could mean death for her. But then she runs back to her father's house. There was something about her father's house that compelled her home again. Not only does the father welcome in his unfaithful daughter, he also welcomes in the indifferent priest. This is the house of the father, where both the villain and the victim are welcome to be refreshed, revived and renewed again. And you might, you might come to our church and go, go, geez, they're such a happy bunch. It's got to be fake. <laughs> well, we'll hang around long enough and you'll see, no, this is actually a representation of the spirit of the Father. This is not fake. This is real. The, the rest of the world is numb and cynical and dark and yeah, suspicious. So suspicious that a smile is now seen with cynicism. Oh, that Rachel Finn, that can't be real. She said she loved us. She doesn't even know me. No, it's the heart of the Father in the Father's house. It's the spirit of the Father in the Father's house. There's a reason this woman ran home. There's a reason she ran home into the arms of her father. Does our church uh, represent the heart of the Father? Because you can, you can have a priest in your house, but does it represent the heart of the Father? The world is asking, the world is looking. Everyone is welcome. And I want you to understand something very clearly today. We will always speak out against the spirits of the age. And I, I'm going to talk more about that as we progress in this story. We will always speak out about the wicked, satanic organizations like Planned Parenthood that manipulate women and men in their most deepest hour of vulnerability. We will always speak out about the aggressive LBGTQ plus agenda that is trying to confuse and corrupt our children. We will speak out against those spirits. Oh, make no mistake. However, I want you to understand that we will also welcome in those who have been most defiled by those wicked organisations with, with open arms. We will speak out against the spirits that are trying to rob and destroy humanity, but this is also the place where a woman who has had an abortion can come and find respite, refreshment, and be greeted with the arms of a loving father. Please don't confuse aggression with the spirit to an aggression with the person who has been defiled by that spirit. And I hope that as the day breaks and we see a generation of people that have been defiled by the spirit of the world, that they find welcome here. Welcome here. What does the Bible say in Romans 3, 23? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all, somebody say all, all are justified. The beauty of the house of the Father is that both the victim and the villain can find healing and welcome if they open their heart up to the spirit of the Father. The house of the Father, there was welcome and there was acceptance. The second thing we see is hospitality and celebration. Oh, that awakened church. They're always having parties. Yes! Because our God is a party God. And maybe you need to redefine what you think a party is. It's not hot boxing and getting so drunk that you can't walk home. It's celebrating with your friends who, who you love and love you. So you can bet your bottom dollar every chance we have to celebrate, we're going to take it. Oh, it's 4th of July? Well, let's get us some hot dogs and a Ferris wheel and paint an American flag on the front of our building and celebrate and thank God for freedom. Oh, it's Mother's Day? Let's get everybody some epic hats and sing them love songs and pour the love of the Father out on them. We are a church that celebrates. Why? because it represents the heart of the Father. If you read your Bible 
And as Pastor Jürgen says, we suggest it. <laughs> and you go through the Old Testament, you'll see God was always commanding the Israelites to have a party. Like there was one, one season where every four days they had to stop and have a party <laughs> because they were so bound in Egypt. They were so used to slavery and oppression. God's like, I got I to gotta party you guys out of prison. I got I to gotta celebrate you into a new age. So don't mind us as we represent the house of the Father. And you should, you should be aware of the churches that, that ridicule this, our, what we do here in the celebration. Oh, they're just... Uh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> Those Pharisees. Are you kidding me? Jesus was so fun. He was so fun. He was a celebrator. Maybe you need to redefine what fun and celebration looks like. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not us. Maybe it's you. Hospitality and celebration are beautiful. It, coming to God's house. That's why we build our churches with mega foyers. Because God doesn't invite us into a service. He invites us into relationship. That's what he does. So we have this massive foyer with a coffee machine and beautiful food. And like I said, we're always throwing parties. Cherish is coming, let's get tacos and churros and one of those epic singers that plays the guitar, the mariachis, let's do it all. Because it's the Father's house. Even the cold-hearted priest stayed longer than he wanted to because he couldn't resist. I like this. But, but what a shame after spending time in the house of the father that he went out and it didn't change him. We'll see. The third thing about the father's house is pr protection and preparation. In Judges 19.9, it says that when they finally stood to, to depart, that is the Levite priest and his concubine wife, that the father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, look, the, the day is now drawing toward evening. It's getting dark out there, you guys. Please, please don't go out in the dark. The day is coming to an end. Stay here that your heart may be merry. How beautiful. God's desire is always that we, we flourish in life. And then tomorrow when it's light, go early so you can make the whole trip home in the light. In God's house, you're going to find protection and preparation. Jesus said rightly to the disciples in the book of John as he was praying, and Jesus prayed a lot of things out loud, not because he needed to know them, but because the people listening did. And he said, oh, Father, I, I do not pray that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Now, now, our job isn't to sequester you in the walls of the church and keep you away from the evil world. But, but we do want to teach you how to walk in the light so you get home safely. The father had a desire that his daughter and his son-in-law would get home safely. In the father's house, you're going to get both protection we're going to teach you how to walk in the light and preparation. We're going to teach you how to walk uprightly in a dark world that wants to stab God in the heart every day. So in the Father's house, it's a banqueting table, not just of celebration, but revelation on how to have the best marriage, on how to live free, life freely and unencumbered by the sins of the world that are lurking ever present as we walk outside these doors. We don't want to keep you from the outside, but we want to prepare you for it. So you're not another statistic. So your marriage doesn't go down the gurgler. So your kids don't lose their ever-loving minds. And so your husband or wife likes you and people want to be friends with you and you're successful in a business sense. Like God's house is so holistic. It has everything. And we want to send you back out into the world, but we don't want you to be a victim of it. We want you to be a light shining in the darkness. When the world is dark, the Bible tells us in the book of John, where the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. That's how we want you to live your life. Amen, Leanne. That's good. That's some good stuff. It's the Father's house. It's the house of the Father and that... That is the spirit, you're hearing it from me, Pastor Jürgen's wife, whatever you want to call me, Pastor Leanne, if you can't handle me having a pastor in front of my name, 
fine. I don't care. Just listen to the message. What I want to tell you is that is the spirit that we are working for and building at Awakened Church. And if you see anything contrary to that, it's an ill spirit and it's a misalignment. It's not who we are. And, and you'll probably meet people that still carry the heart of the cold-hearted priest in church because church is welcome to all. And regardless of whether people are loved and nurtured rightly, just like this story shows us, they can still have a uh, crooked spirit. All right, let's keep moving. The house of the Levite. So we've, this is, can you see why this woman ran home? Well, of course she did. She was celebrated. She re- was refreshed. She was welcomed. She was greeted. She was provided for. Her father offered protection. Of course, of course she ran home. Now let's contrast it with the house of the Levite. And I'm sorry, this is going to get a little darker. The first difference we see in the house of the Levite is unlike the house of the father, is that he used people and didn't care for them. He's looking for a woman to fulfill a need in him, but he doesn't want to give back. He wants a baby mama. He doesn't want a wife. Can I put it very plainly? And I'm not trying to be shocking. He wants to prostitute. He doesn't want a wife. He wants sex without responsibility. Hello, America, you are here. What a horrible feeling to to come into a house where there is a priest, people of God like us, and feel used and not developed, used and not discarded, uh, used and then discarded. And and we're seeing this play out and be exposed in, in churches around the world. As our Heavenly Father says, it is enough now. You will not treat the bride of Christ like a concubine anymore. You will not use her and then discard her when her use runs out. That's not the spirit of the Father. You want to know what the spirit of the Father is? We can read it in Proverbs 31 when we hear about the Proverbs 31 woman. How does that scripture start? Who can find a virtuous woman or wife? It doesn't say who can find a virtuous concubine. Who can find a virtuous wife? For great is her worth. The writer is so, so careful here. Before we hear about these epic things that this woman does, the first thing that is established is her value. And a lot of us, we want to, we want to extract the good, but, but not value the person. That is not God's way. That's not how it's done. Whatever we cherish and, and value will blossom, but whatever we use will wither. In the house of the priest, people of, of this priest, this Levite priest, they were used and then discarded. Who knew what talents lay within this beautiful woman, but they were never realised because she was only used for what she could give, but never treasured or honoured for who she was. You are a son or a daughter of God. You are not a client. You are not a cog in a wheel. I want to ask you this question. Do you use people? And this is a question for both the priests and the parishioners. There are a lot of priests out there that will use people and then discard them when they serve no more purpose and it's wicked. And God is calling those priests to account. But make no mistake, it exists in parishioners too. Oh, I'm rocking up to church. I'll extract from the bride of Christ, but baby, I ain't given back. Oh, I want a good message and I want a free book and I want a free coffee and I want to go to every connector and I want, I want, I want. But it, it comes time to invest back into the bride of Christ and all oh, we realize, oh, this was a one-way street. It's the spirit of the cold-hearted priest. We're, we're never gonna make you serve and contribute and give or do any of those things, but trust me, you will reveal your own heart in how you behave. Galatians 5.13 says something amazing and we, sometimes we can use this scripture so one dimensionally. For you were called to freedom, brothers, but do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Use it through, to serve one another in love. Isn't this interesting? 
In this church, you are free, you are free to serve or not to serve. We are never gonna, gonna demand you. You are free to tithe or not to tithe. Hey, you don't wanna tithe, you rock on with your bad self. But understand, we have a, a responsibility, and I'm just gonna say it plainly, to use our freedom not to serve ourselves, but to serve one another in love. How was the house of the Levite priest so different to the house of the father? In the house of the father, they were cherished. They were valued, they were loved, they were nurtured. We don't ever hear the father pulling the son-in-law inside and, or the daughter. He knew how to get the best out of people. He created an environment of love and nurture and value. This is a story to the church, but it's also a a story for us to look within ourselves. Have we treated the bride of Christ like a concubine, a selfish, self-indulgent, self-serving attitude when it comes to God's bride? And I so strongly hear the Lord saying, I will not allow my bride to be treated like a concubine anymore. Don't just extract from her from the bride of Christ. Commit yourself to her. What, what was the difference between the priest and the father? The, the father was committed to them, but the priest refused to come into covenant. He wouldn't come into covenant. And there are people here today and you've refused to make a commitment to the church. And you may have your reasons, some of them in your mind, valid. But I'm standing here today as a prophetess of the Lord telling you the Lord is calling us to account and saying, I will not let my bride be treated like a concubine anymore. She is not bargain basement goods. Jesus stretched out His arms and died for her. He said, I am building my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. The second difference we see in the house of the Levite priest was that he allowed the innocent to be defiled to protect himself. This this is a point that I feel so strongly about because I believe that a lot of the darkness and the depravity and the defilement in our world today has been because priests and pastors and Christians, believers, have allowed the innocent to be defiled by their lack of courage. I mean, what we see in this story is a major inversion. Every great nation is known by its treatment of women and children. You see any nation that abuses women or children, that, that's a, a nation that is begging for destruction and perversion to take over. And we can look at the spirit of the world and we see that the spirit of the world was so aggressive in this story that the perverted men which, which represent the spirit of this age, were beating on the door, beating on the door to the point where, where the old man was like, do not do this, this wicked thing. Men, do not do this vile thing, but they did not heed him. Why? Because the spirit of the world cannot be satiated. And one of the biggest mistakes that many pastors and churches and Christians have made is they, that they have thought that, that they could placate or pander to this spirit. And somehow if we, if we just panned it, if we say nothing, it'll, it'll die down. It won't die down. It's a satanically motivated spirit come from the devil himself. Read your Bible, Revelation. Woe to you heavens and earth, for the, sea and earth. For the devil has come down to you and he is full of fury for he knows his time is short. There are spirits of this age that are seeking to defile the innocents. Where was the priest? My God called of God to stand as proxy for a world that is about to be ravaged. And you're hiding in the freaking house? What in the world? This is wrong. And you may say to yourself, oh, that Pastor Jürgen always getting into politics. Yes. Because the policies that we allow to remain and go uncontested and do not stand in the gap for are the very ones that defile our innocence. And we will not let the innocence be defiled on our 
watch. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. Well, I don't want to talk about how abortion is killing 2,000 American citizens a day. And it's the leading cause of death in America, but it's not recorded as death. Because what if they turn their aggression on me? Why did the priest and even the old man stay in the house while the innocent concubine was ravaged again and again and again? Because they didn't want to get attacked. Pastor Jürgen and I will gladly clap. Because we're living for eternity, not for today. And one day I'm going to stand before the Father and He's going to say, Oh, priest, oh, shepherd, when the wolves were howling, did you stand in the gap or were you a hiling? Did you run away? And you know what? God has been our defender. You, you really think, priest, that if you hadn't had have done the courageous thing and said to the old man, old man, you've lived in perversion, in a perverse world for far too long and I thank you for your hospitality. However, you've been defiled too. What you're suggesting, throwing out your virgin daughter, it's always the innocence, trust me, it's always the innocence that suffer when that spirit of perversion is not contended by Christian men and women and priests who have the Word of God on the inside of them. Oh man, what are you thinking? We're not sending my wife out there. We're not sending this woman out there. This is our job. We are men, we are believers, we are Christians. And run out into that public square himself. Do you really think that God in heaven would not have seen the courage of that priest and sent forth legions of angels from every corner of heaven in his defense? But we will never know because he hid in the house while the woman screamed. And what's worse, the Bible says that he slept. When he arose the next morning, what? A woman that you've been intimate with have extracted things from? You were just in the house of her father and you're sleeping while she's screaming. Why do we talk about the things that we talk about and get the labels we get and persecution we get because I can't sleep while the world screams. I cannot sleep while the world screams. Under the weight of the ridiculous destructive policies. Why why would an awakened church show 2,000 mules? Because an election was fraudulently stolen, stolen so they could implement the policies that the world is now screaming under. Makes sense to me. And all of heaven, all of heaven would have backed him up. Now there's a man of courage and God has been our defender. It's not that people have not thrown their arrows and we have not been ridiculed and humiliated, but God has been our defender. If God is for me, then who can be against me? Oh, they may try. The greatest tragedy in the world today is not the left's progressive agenda or the LGBTQ teaching. It is a lack of courage in our churches. It's a lack of courage. Did this woman get defiled and abused day after day after day because of the spirit of the world or was it the neglect of the priest? We, we have to ask ourselves that question. He let the innocence be defiled to save himself. Oh, we don't like talking about politics. Coward. I'm saying it. Coward. And the Bible talks about it in Revelation. It says, don't you know that? Cowards. The sexually immoral, all these other things will be at the end thrown into the lake of fire. They shoved cowards in there. And you thought being a coward was a neutral thing. God judges it harshly. And it's always the innocents that pay the price. You might be fine, safe in your house with your head on a my pillow. (laughs) But outside, outside, 
The innocents are screaming, being ravaged, while inside, the priests and the Christians play Kumbaya one more time. A house can have a priest, and there are many wonderful priests out there, but it doesn't always mean that it represents the heart of the Father. And finally, his final crime. If the priest didn't use this woman enough in life, he also used her in death. He divided what he was meant to revive. Listen to this in Judges 19, 27 to 29. When her master arose in the morning, speaking of the concubine, and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way, I mean, just that in itself is so like beyond tone deaf that you could sleep all night and open the door and see the result of the world being so ravaged by a spirit that you were anointed to contend against and you looked down. There was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold, looking for rescue, but not finding any. And he said to her, get up and let us be going. What a cold heart, but there was no answer. And really, is he surprised that there's no answer? Because he didn't answer when she was calling. And we wonder why the world can't answer the hard questions. It's because when we were asked them, the church was silent. When the church loses its voice and its courage, the the world will always lose its way. So the man then lifted her onto the donkey and the man got up and went to his place. When he entered his house, he took a knife and laid hold of his concubine and divided her into 12 pieces limb by limb and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. She died with her hand grasping the doorway and when he opens the door, he doesn't look down for signs of life. He doesn't even look down to see is this woman still breathing? The Bible doesn't even say if she's dead, but he just looked down, didn't see an answer. Oh, she must be dead. She must have expired because of my cowardice. I'm gonna toss her on a donkey and then I'm gonna take her home and I'm gonna cut her up limb by limb. I am gonna cut her up and then send her out to all the tribes of Israel and virtue signal, this is what the spirit of perversion does. What? This is what you're neglected. In her final days, you're using her as an example of what the spirit of the age does. You hypocrite. This wasn't just the spirit of the age. This was your cowardice. Where were you when she was screaming in the night? In his final act, he cuts her up and he sends her out. Instead of looking down, repenting before God, this was me. This was my cowardice. I could have stopped it. God, forgive me. And then performing CPR and looking for signs of life. He didn't even check. He just cut her up and sent her away. Virtue signaled. As the day breaks, when we see the innocents, and remember, they're all someone's baby who were born into, who knows? There's always a story behind a story. We've got to be very careful that we never attack the person. We're going to, not everybody got an upbringing like mine. They, They didn't. Horrible things have happened because the church was silent. And they wander into the world looking for rescue. And instead of looking down for signs of life and reviving His bride, He divided the bride. We are not called to be undertakers. We are called to be revivalists. Don't don't cut up what God has sent to our door to revive. Revive, revive. Don't divide the bride. Revive the bride. Revive the bride. And you may look down at her bruised and bleeding and bloody body, representing the effects of the spirit of this world that has been able to ravage her again and again and again and judge her dead. Check for signs of life. Check for signs of life. They too are sons and daughters of God. And yes, there are some people who don't want God and hate God and the whole thing. But there are just as many who are looking for rescue. And they may bear the bruises and the blood and the residue of being overwhelmed by the spirit of this world. But don't call 
dead what God is asking us to revive? Are they dead or are they in shock? She was just raped through the night. She's not looking for someone to virtue signal. She's looking for someone to revive her. Like the scene at a hero that I love so much, the deliverance scene. Say it if it's worth saving me. And God is shaking the whole church to get the Spirit of the Father back into the house of the priest. I'm praying that the two become one again. So if you needed a message that described the heart and the hope of Awakened Church, that's it. We're not undertakers, we're revivalists. We don't divide and cut up that which God has called us to revive. We are revivalists. We are revivalists. We are revivalists. We are revivalists. And at the dawning of a new age, when the most broken of this world wander into the threshold of the church, they will not find a shut door and a cold-hearted priest. They will find the Spirit of the Father for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely through His grace. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I thank You. I thank You. What an honour it is to represent You, God. Father, open our eyes, sober us up in all our fighting against the spirits of this age. Let us not cut the wrong thing. Father, let us represent Your heart so beautifully to this world that is so broken and been so ravaged by so many houses of priests that haven't carried the house, the Spirit of the Father, that are now bearing the brokenness of a fallen world. God, give us eyes to see. Let us see people with eyes of faith, not overwhelmed by what's happened to them, but Father, eyes of faith to see who they truly are and what they can be. In Jesus' name. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenedchurch.com.